What up, podheads? Welcome to the Podio Slave Podcast. We're here again, geeking out. I'm here. My name's Nate. I'm here with my co-hosts, Tony and Anthony. How you guys doing tonight, man? Ed Helms, we are back. <laughs> I'm doing good, guys. This is always fun. Yeah, me too. Uh, excited, excited about what we've got in store for you tonight. We just had a great conversation with uh, a band member from a band that we all love. And you clicked on the episode so you know it. But yeah, it... <laughs> When we started this thing, these are the types of conversations we'd hope we'd have. Like it, we'd be shining lights on records that meant something to us from twenty, twenty five years ago, and and we got to do that tonight. Exactly. Yep. We had uh, Chad Benecos of uh, the original Head PE or Head Planet Earth. To be honest, when we put this podcast together, actually that was a band on the spreadsheet as like. Eventually, it'd be nice to talk to one of these guys about the early records. You know, it'd be cool because. It's kind of a niche record. It's kind of a niche band. Some people know about them. Some people don't. But, you know, geeks, music nerds, we want to know about this shit. So tonight, two and a half fucking years later, it worked out. We talked to Chad. We geeked out on the self-titled record, which is my favorite head PE record of their catalog. And um, it was great. It was awesome. It was like Greg from Zebrahead. Same scene, talking about the early 90s and taking risks and uh, putting out some for us at least personally some some very important music so yeah here it is our conversation with chad benecos original rhythm guitarist and founding member of head pe Hey guys, Tony here. If you like this episode or you are, are here because you're a fan of Head P.E., we just had a killer series on Tattoo the Earth, which Head P.E. played in 2000 uh, with bands like Amen and Sepultura. And uh, we had the, the most recent iteration of Tattoo the Earth came back in, in August of 2022. We had Anthrax and we had Brian Fair of Overcast. And yeah, go, go check that out. It's back there. And we've got a bunch of other stuff too. I mean, we've got nerdery galore, us talking about music and records that we love on top of a bunch of interviews with about 60 or so people back there too. So PodioSlave.com is where that all lives, at PodioSlave on Twitter and Instagram, TikTok, wherever. Yep, we're there. Check it out. Thanks. All right, Chad, nice to talk to you. Nice to see you. Excited to, to chat about 25 years of self-titled head PE. How are you? Good. I'm good, man. How are you guys? We're good. We're good. We're excited to do this. Uh, we, we like to start off with, a, with an icebreaker. Uh, we've been in the middle of, this is actually going to come out probably at the end of it, a, a project that you know, took a ton of our summer and, and was about six weeks long. We also have been fans of Head P and your early work that, that when you were in the band, a ton when we were younger, we listened to, you know, Broke on repeat yeah. and then went backwards and found Self Titled. And I think all three of us ride for Self Titled even more as much as we love Broke. But wow. yeah, no, it was one of those records we would just always put on when we were partying. It was just, let's, yeah. let's, let's crack some, you know, Self Titled, listen to, uh, <laughs> Ken 2012 and just have fun, you know? <laughs> yeah, I'm glad. Because of our fandom of Head PE and all that, it kind of led to our project because we were, uh, I think Nate was looking through Instagram and saw a product had posted about the book that Scott Alderman put out around Tattoo the Earth. And we were like, man, we should probably try to talk to Scott. And then it turned into talking to all these people and now talking to you a little bit about that too. So thanks for, you know, being an inspiration for that shit. Ah, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I feel bad. I feel bad because uh, I know you guys wanted to talk about tattoo, and as embarrassing as it is, I don't remember a shit ton of it. <laughs> yeah, is that a good? Thing, I, have, I have memories, and I have specific things I remember about it and, and people, but it's weird. Like I remember a lot about you know certain things, but tattoo is sort of a blur. It's weird. Mm -hmm. You're not the first person to tell us that, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> yeah, it was, it's a trippy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah we, not surprised given all the antics that we've heard so far. It seems like it was a complete shit show in a good way, you know, just DIY central. Yeah, it was um it was it was rough a little bit. It seemed like it, it was a little rough at times. But everyone was dedicated to get through it. So yeah, 
it's, it's, it's fun, fun time. Well, and now it's alive again, so. <laughs> yeah, I know it's probably gonna be fucking badass now. Yeah, we're recording this before the the concert, but uh, if this when this drops, we'll have been to it and our content's back there. So go check that out. Cool. So. Let's talk 25 years of, of self-titled. That dropped, what, August of 1997, which is Ooh, absolutely yeah. wild to us. Yeah. First thoughts for you, just how do you feel about that being 25 years old now? Man, it's a, time flies, obviously. It's weird, right? It, it's even weirder, too, because 97 is a a lot of those songs, we, we had them on our EP that we made. We, we put an EP out. We weren't called Head PE. We were just called Head forever. Just Head. That's how we made our name for ourselves. And we put out an EP with a lot of those songs that are on the... So we were doing that shit even years before that. Trippy to think about it, you know, being so long ago. And what was happening at the time. And trippy. Trippy, dude. Mm -hmm. I didn't look back for a super long time until recently. I just kind of went, oh, I made peace with a lot of it. And went, oh, wow. Maybe we did do some shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> You yeah. really did. You cut it at a really cool time because we've had a, uh, actually he's kind of a friend of the podcast now, Greg Bergdorf. You probably know him from Zebrahead, kind of coming oh, up in your seat. Yeah. He's come on here like three times just to geek out with us. And uh, yeah, like the OC scene early to mid nineties had its own vibe and uh, the self-titled record. And like you said, that EP really, it seems like, and we're, and we're obviously speaking de facto, but like we saw that, we heard that, we were like, man, it must have been fucking amazing in SoCal in like early 90s, 95, 97. Yeah, dude. Um, I was telling somebody, I, I had just did, I had just talking to somebody on a podcast and um, I was telling him like, wow, you know, when we started the band, we, we knew what we wanted to do, right? Yeah. We kind of wanted to, I mean, all of us were wanting to obviously stick, stick with our heavier roots and a little bit punk, but um we only had like the beastie boys were like my shit back then mm. check your head was on, on and um rage was out so they were kind of doing it not a hip-hop thing and sublime was right around our neighborhood and dougie's from that click you know it's only a town over so we got to see sublime a lot and they're doing like a reggae punk thing so everyone was sort of mixing up stuff and it wasn't as like it wasn't as uh novelty as it was in the past yeah, not not knocking anthrax and public enemy because that was my shit too right I, I thought it was great but it was like a one-off right right no bands were really doing it that was like seriously trying to do it so we and we wanted to and i think back about it now i'm like wow what the fuck balls that we had to even think that we could do, do that <laughs> you know uh, but yeah trippy dude so you knew what you wanted to do. Were you surprised, like, after Church of Realities came out that, like, Jive, a label like Jive would take interest? Was that, like, were you surprised or? A little. I didn't really, not really, dude. Like, I, I don't want this to sound weird, but, um, you know, it was just a time. It was a time for us. So we put our own record out. And that band, Head, got really popular, dude, mm -hmm. in the early days. And I remember telling Jared, uh, we were roommates, you know, even before we started the band and we were super, super tight. And I was like, dude, you know what I want to fucking do? I don't want to open up for anybody anymore. I want to play our own show. I want to headline it. And I want it to be sold out, dude. And I don't want to know anybody in line. I don't want it to be my friends. You know what I mean? And all that. I want it to be like just fucking perfect strangers. That would be the shit. And um, it happened. It was like mm -hmm. two or three months later, we headlined and it was fucking sold out That's around awesome. the block. Nice. And uh, we were both like, dude, is this really, wow. And then there's no internet, you know, it's all flyers and, and, and the scene shit. And then it was like every show was sold out after that. And then because we were all on this little click, Deftones, Corn, and us and, you know, Snot system, we were all there together, right? Everyone had their own fucking thing. I just felt like, oh yeah, we're definitely going to get signed and, we're not going to settle for nothing. It was like that. We were super like, fuck that. We want the, you know, yeah. we want the world. That was kind of like that. So when Jive came around, we were more like, eh, really? Why would we sign with you guys? You know? Mm. Oh, uh, but wow. they, us, and we made a choice, a conscious choice to not sign with Sony and not sign with Atlantic or Capital or any of the labels. They all, they are were all there for us. We went with Jive on a very specific, like, oh, we're going to do this fucking thing. That might be rad. Uh, just took a chance on it, you know? Yeah. 
and it worked because we live on the opposite coast, but probably about as far away from <laughs> from where you guys started uh, growing up at, around this time. So we got that music. That stuff made its way to Southern Maine, and we were, you know, it was in our CD players. It was in our boom boxes yeah. in 1999, we were, 2000. A tribe called Quest. I'll, I'm a big fan. I'll I'll admit it, and I was actually really into the drive thing because of them mostly obviously we were doing a hip-hop thing and we were really very focused on the genre of hip-hop as a musical style and being white dudes and, and, and my my background came i came from like the thrash and the punk thing you know i wasn't being like i'm gonna play a hip-hop guy you know but jared wanted to MC, and we and we thought about it we're like well we could do the music we paid really close attention to the music. It wasn't like we're a rock band with a, a singer and then we're doing rock riffs and the guy's rapping over it. Nah, we were going for something totally different. Like, let's respect the genre of hip hop as a musical thing and all that. So we thought, oh, this is going to be great if we're on Jive. That gives us so much credibility. We're already taking the music so seriously. It only hurt that they didn't have relationships with rock radio for us, right? <laughs> we're kind of on our own in that way but still like you know looking back you can't change the past but it kind of led to some pretty cool things for us that other bands didn't get at the same time that we didn't get things that they got you know what i mean yeah right on yeah totally now for the context for the listener too like jive records in this era well i guess 97 is before but the era that we discovered had pe 99 2000 ish like you're talking like backstreet boys britney spears and then head pe Self-titled in particular is talking about subject matter that is not even remotely something you'd put on the radio. You're talking about UFOs I, and yeah, crazy yeah. shit. <laughs> I, I think that the Britney Spears and the pop thing happened after. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. When we signed our deal, their big thing was Tribe and then you know, all the hip-hop shit. But while we were touring the record, it was like a two-year period of us touring the debut. Then they signed all those bands. And when we got home, we were getting ready to write Broke. Britney Spears was already fucking dominating dude mm, yeah. wow. same with other bands then sync and them and, and jive just had all this money <laughs> you know uh not from us but we thought oh fuck we we blew it you know like they signed us they were all excited we sold you know a couple hundred thousand records you know fuck a gold record right when you're dealing <laughs> with that shit we're, we, we were like we're failures you know mm -hmm. but they stood by us they were like no no no, no. we got money now and, and we believe in you so make another record and, and we'll give you even more support. And they did. And, and that's what happened with Broke. But yeah, they were just, they turned into the pop label. It was a trip. We didn't have any, uh, they wouldn't even let us near Britney Spears, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fuck that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's pretty wild though. If you think about that, because the, and I know you both Anthony and Nate context is key. You say that all the time, Tuan, but it, it is because at that time that, Selling that many records, think about that through today's lens. People would kill for that, and yeah. and you're you're considered or you think you're considered a failure because it's the boy yeah. band craze, it's the Britney Spears craze where they're selling millions upon millions like first week. So well, also yeah, but also like our friend, our fucking peers, like you know it, when we were all on the streets, you know, and, and this is you know, Sublime hadn't even blown up yet. We we thought we were the band that was going to be. You know what I mean? So now Korn's got a a, a, a platinum album, and right. Sublime got a double platinum. Deftones came out right before us, and they probably almost went platinum. And we were like, "Fuck! What the fuck happened?" You know, like maybe we're just too crazy. I don't know. So yeah, we we definitely felt like we didn't succeed as far as we were supposed to. And I know that does sound weird because you know you make indie artists are like, "Oh my god, I sold six thousand you know but when you're dealing with that much money you know you you, you, you know you're expected to sell like way more <laughs> yeah yeah well, it's Trippy. interesting when I listen to self-titled and, and with the backdrop of the EP where a lot of those songs from the EP went to the full the full length I feel like and you can correct me it feels like you guys had full creative control of that album or 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 was there pressure from Vi uh, from Jive no no I think no, we did whatever we wanted, dude. Uh, we toned it down a tiny bit. If you listen to the EP that we put out, almost all those songs are on the debut. But then, like, 
that was back when you know you did a hidden track that was the big thing back then but we had a whole our hidden track was like a whole hidden fucking universe i don't know if you ever heard it oh yeah so we we toned that shit back and you know uh we just tried to like make the songs the best we could but we didn't know any better we didn't think we were gonna get it on the radio anyway so we were like well fuck it who cares you know um let's just make the craziest bombest shit that we can make and then later we realized like oh man like of course, you know, Kid Rock's getting played on the radio, <laughs> and we're not. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And there's no comparison there, uh, really. But, yeah, we sort of went, oh, fuck, now. They jived didn't tell us a damn thing. They just went, oh, okay, killer. Can't wait for it to be done. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and they were excited like we were. We just didn't know any better. We just thought, let's make the craziest, coolest thing that we can. And we're lucky as listeners, though, because there's only a few bands that had that kind of unique positioning and it was basically you guys and incubus with with science you know it's like this out of control fucking multi-genre record you know incubus is like funk and like metal and hip-hop like same with the self-titled album it's so out there i listened to it like like three times today it's like ifo to 33 to hill to ken 2012 it's like none of this shit's ever gonna get played on the radio but like you guys were yeah. like, like you said, you're going to do your own thing. And you put out this fucking mat. Like, honestly, it's a masterpiece album. It's fucking sick. But it would, I can't see any radio station playing any of those singles because it's just, it's an art piece. Like, it's supposed to be, you know, scribbles yeah. in, the, in the notebook over the years. Yeah. There's not one song I could even go, ooh, maybe they could play that one. No, <laughs> yeah, right. one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> fucking one, dude. <laughs> not even now. Uh, that it's been saturated to the craziness where it's like, blending of like hip hop sensibilities and rock and metal and all that is like, it's been done a million times now, mm-hmm. you know, 25 years later, but back then, no. And plus like the other thing is Jared, you know, like our first song we ever did was spam in 33. It was put together. It was like one song. We put it as two songs on the debut, but when we put our demo out, it was like punk song and it went right to hip hop. And that was like our big, you know, thing. But, you know, it's like you can't drop the N-word every five seconds and expect a radio station to get behind it or mm-hmm. parents want you to listen to it, you know, but that's where we were at. So it was no surprise to me, dude, that, you know, bands easily just passed us up, you know. Even controversial bands like, like I don't know, like Korn, he's singing about some heavy shit, you know. Yeah. Um, but their package was so tight. And they yeah. fit in with, they could just go on the road with metal bands and rock radio would play it. And there was no like controversy there really where Jared comes out and it's, you know, <laughs> here's a fucking spectacle, dude. And a lot of people just hated us just because of that, you know, the racism thing. But yeah, you know. Well, we loved it. <laughs> Thanks. <dude. laughs> I, we, you know, it, it definitely struck a chord with 16, 17, 18 year old us. So <laughs> yeah, I, I, I saw it too. I thought, oh, this is what Metallica did. No one wanted to play them. And everyone was playing, you know, whatever the fuck, you know, and I was that age where I was like, holy shit, you know, being a 14 or whatever, like, oh my God, Metallica is the coolest thing ever. Mm-hmm. How come they're not playing on the radio? But they didn't need it, you know? Eventually they broke through, but those first few records, it was like, maybe it was because they weren't on the radio and they seemed just like us, right? Skate shoes, dirty clothes, fucking they just cared about the music. I loved that shit so much. I was hoping that maybe we were sort of doing that, you know, mm-hmm. like fucking the system or whatever. I don't know. How was it in that era? Because I, again, context is key. You guys are original. This is your your thing. And then to see some other bands maybe kind of jacking that style. How was that? Did you guys feel like, all right, well, they got yeah. that from us. Yeah. 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 <laughs> sure. We didn't say it back then. We were cool, like, okay. It, it, see, it was almost like not even a, um, a secret. Uh, I was really very, very protective over, like, my friends and, and people that were doing something on their own. Like, like, I didn't want no other bands to, like, dress up and do a corn thing. I'm like, let, you let them have their own fucking thing. You don't need a tracksuit and a seven string. You know what I mean? <laughs> and when people would come to me, I had to, like, I was trying to like, I, even in the back of the day when I first got the talk box, I went through a huge talk box phase. I didn't put it on the first record, but kids were coming up and just taking pictures of my pedal board and coming right up to me with no shame. And I didn't even feel weird about it, but they were like, dude, we want to be just like you. Like we have a band. We want to be just like your band. And I was like, 
oh, that's cool. Like you shouldn't want to be like us. You should do whatever you want to do, but that's what you want to do. That's what you want to do. But <laughs> that was more innocent when I saw bands come out and sell records and definitely people were telling us like, Hey, they've been listening to your death or your EP since day one. I know those guys and they wouldn't give us credit. That's when we got mad. Like really bitch, you fucking mm-hmm. just give the respect where it's due. Yep. That would be cool. And we started to like gravitate. Like once we were like, kind of the underdogs and bands were now popular you'd get like the lincoln parks and the papa roaches and these bands like they would come up to us with no problem like we fucking watched you guys we opened up for you or we came we did this and that because of you guys and then they would take us out on tour as their support band because they respected us right Mm -hmm. and i love that i was like you guys are fucking cool because you're not threatened by us at all. You're, you're, you're your own fucking thing. And you're willing to take us out to open for you. That's just balls. That's badass. But some bands were just like, they wouldn't even mention our name because they didn't want anyone to make that comparison. But it is what it is. You know what I mean? Man, something came to mind. And I don't know if it's, you know, I don't know if this is accurate or not. But is one of those bands Slint Biscuit? I mean, I'm thinking... I mean, we read somewhere Fred Durst was influenced by the EP. Significant other, or sorry, three dollar bill came out after had PE self titled, so it's like you know, chicken or the egg kind of thing. Oh, I have, I have a feeling he was listening listen to that EP. It, they're not the only ones, dude. Yeah, they're not the only ones, and that's okay. The only thing that didn't sit well with us was, okay, you guys are incredibly popular. It'd probably be a really cool move if you went, hey, listen there's this fucking band, right? And you should know about them. Obviously, they're not going to be as commercially viable, but this is where this this shit came from, right? Mm -hmm. But I think that it would be probably like, why would you want to do that if you're still trying to like promote yourselves as maybe you came up with this thing all on your own. You you never heard that band. That's maybe the thing, but they weren't the only ones to do it. And they weren't the only ones that told us, you know, like we had like, people that write for magazines and interview for TV. And they would tell us that like, Hey, you should put your record out, dude. Cause I was in it. I with those guys that are bumping your EP that yeah. you guys put out. I'm like, Oh my God, really? I'm like, of course. Like everybody knows your shit. What are you talking about? Everyone's waiting for your record. So it just helped a lot of bands that we didn't cross over that big, you know, mm-hmm. but we, we met kid rock in the beginning, dude, before he was barely doing, he kind of had his own idea about it too. I'll at least give it to him, but they definitely like, I mean, all those guitar players would come right up to me like, what are you guys doing? Like, how'd you do that? How'd you do this? Uh, you know, so what are you going to do? What are we going to do? You know, get mad? It's like, <laughs> yeah. fuck, man. I mean, cover your pedal board. Just cover yeah. it. <laughs> oh, dude. So I have this, where is it? I don't know if you can see. Uh, okay. I have this talk box, right? Like, <laughs> see that thing down there? yeah digital yeah. Oh, yeah. nice okay so i have about five of those that came out with those back in the day um they don't make them anymore different type of talk box you, you sing into a microphone and you put your guitar into it and then it blends the you, you pick the notes from your guitar it synthesizes your voice and it's like a, it's a different talk box in the 70s right and i fucking people wouldn't stop asking me how i was doing it <laughs> so i had doug spray paint it all <laughs> fucked up so no one could see what it was back in the day so I was like I was trying to kind of be secretive about it how we were doing everything but yeah that's all that but you know what dude I've done that I've gone to shows and went oh my god there's his pedals like mm-hmm. I just kind of you know I'm I'm obsessed dude with with certain things and so I would do the same thing you know I corner I cornered plenty of guitar players like hey, hey what <laughs> are you using you know and they'd be like are you fucking for real dude like <laughs> care about that shit like oh my god your shit's the best you know so i i know where that it, that that inspiration comes from i fucking i am that you know what i mean yeah. um so yeah well and they say I, i'm gonna butcher the, the same but they say that the best artists are thieves right i mean that's <laughs> you have to pull from your influences to make what you end up being so that, that makes sense yeah a little bit you know i know some really hot shot guitar players dude that are doing really well and i remember one of my friends was telling me, he's like, yeah, isn't that how you do it? You just borrow from something in the past? And I go, no, I was really against that. Like, no, fuck no. You should just come up with shit that you like and do it. But the older I got, the more I realized, like, 
yeah, I think you're supposed to reference the greats. How are you going to get great? You know, mm-hmm. you got to dissect John Lennon and Paul McCartney's vocals. How are you going to learn how to sing harmonies? You know, how, how are you going to, you can't just come out and be like, oh, I'm Kurt Cobain. <laughs> you know, you're like, yeah. he had influences, you know? Right. I think imitation is, is flattery ultimately, but you know, I don't know if you've, you've toured, probably toured at 311, like 311, they had referenced like Shooty's Groove as being an influence. And then they put up sound system you're like oh i see the i see the relation Isn't there that cool? yeah. that's yeah. cool for me and that's what we did too like i have no problem going hey when we started our band we had rage against the machine was there first they yeah. weren't doing hip-hop but they were fucking brutal and the bc boys were punk and playing their own instruments and doing hip-hop sublime's right there you right. know what i mean i don't mind saying it. oh and 311 i used to go watch 311 mm-hmm. like they got me really excited so uh, i've never been one to like shy away from saying the things that influenced us when we were starting our band but it did feel weird when other bands were influenced by us and didn't give us like yeah. the recognition i was like wow i wonder why they're doing that but whatever yeah. sounds very led zeppelin and greta van fleet-esque it's a running <laughs> running joke on here but you know what i mean <laughs> my best friend who i did a band with right after head pe his name is scott he's in a band called rival sons mm-hmm. and um they're great and they're doing like a, 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 a real rock thing. And they had to go open up for Greta Van Fleet. And I was like, what the fuck, dude? Like, <laughs> how are you going to deal with that? And I'm like, oh, you know, like, maybe they're thankful of us. And it's one of those things, trying to be all pragmatic about it. But I was like, wow, it's trippy. You know, you can see what they're doing. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Yeah. The funny thing is they don't. They don't really own it, which is kind of weird. <laughs> I know. Too young to own it yet. Yeah. So, Chad, we talked no clear singles on self-titled, but you guys did film a couple videos, like for Ground yeah. and Serpent Boy. Let's talk those videos. Like, we, we're we nerds. Like, we still watch those fucking videos. So, Ground we made. Jive paid for that, and, and it was low budget. But Serpent Boy, I don't did you make a video for that? Or was it just like a live thing? It might have been just like a compilation then, yeah. Yeah, you know what that came from? We were friends with all the guys that were doing this company that made sunglasses called black flies and um there i think it was like their main guy i loved us and he came and filmed us and he just cut that video for us like hey i made this for you and we're like oh rad you know what I mean? wow. especially back then yeah especially. yeah yeah now you can make videos anyone i mean a fucking movie you know what i mean like anyone <laughs> can do it now. so the, the ground video is that car that's product's car right yeah that's a, that was this real car did he live in it? <laughs> no, he didn't live in it. He might have spent a lot of time in it. He's he's definitely that way. He really only cares about surfing and skating and spray painting and mm-hmm. DJ. He's he's never changed. He's always been very like very just keeps it really real. He's a genuine guy. But yeah, that was his real car, dude. Had bullet holes in it. <laughs> oh, that thing was yeah. fucked up. Hey, pause. If you're listening right now, pause this and go watch that video, and you'll see all that stuff. It's awesome. <laughs> well, there's oh, like little shit. gems in there too, like Steve's Liquors. Like, was that a local local hangout yeah, spot? That was okay. So Jared I think and it's I, still there. Probably, it's still there. Oh, it's in Huntington <laughs> Beach. Yeah, and we called that guy Steve, but he was Asian. Uh, this is an old dude that ran it. But yeah, that was that place is legendary, and it was about a hundred feet from our apartment. Me, Jared, and Wes <laughs> had a had a house that we rented and it was when we did the EP and we got signed and that was our spot where you just go get shit. And we filmed that. <laughs> That's a little homage, you know? Yeah. Well, it's funny. Cause like we were talking about pre-show, like we're all from Southern Maine, Portland, Maine area. And I live in San Diego now. So like when I first moved to Southern California, I started checking out all these spots and like listening to your record and a bunch of other bands from Southern California. I started to like, see all these things that I would hear in songs. And I think Steve's liquor, I drove by and like, wait, hold on a second. That must be, that yeah, must be it. Right. Yeah. 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 Yep. yeah. It's there. It's still there. <laughs> Where else you check out, Nate? S- sombrero? Blink-182 yeah. sombrero, sombrero and Blink. Yeah. Yep. yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, just, it's yeah. almost like you got to con- confirm, trust, but verify. You just want to put your shit in the video, you know, and like represent your town and shit. You know how it is. I mean, we, we do, do we do the same thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We shout we shout out like local record stores that we grew up with and stuff. But uh, Chad, I got a, I got a few questions. I mean, fucking that first record, man, it really does just it slays. I'm a big guitar nerd, drums too, but guitars like that's why we're all into this. 
and a lot of the riffs on this record are just fucking wild like wild shit like i just saw chili peppers last week at sofi stadium like frashante is fucking a wizard but yeah. yeah fucking john dude he's your favorite <laughs> is that what he said uh he's well i mean as far as like a peer that's like my age yeah dude he fucking blew he blew my mind wide open dude mm-hmm. nice yeah that first solo record that he made Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I couldn't stop listening to it. I know a lot of people don't like that shit. Now they're reaching back and starting to appreciate for what it is. But I was like, this is the shit. Like, we're all making four track reverse guitar demos, but no one's putting it out. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And he was doing that, and I bought all his shit. And when he first joined the band back again, then he did uh, to record Water for 10 days. And they mm-hmm. were just kind of with, I guess, Californication, right? We were in. We were on tour with Papa Roach in Italy, in, in, in Europe. We went to Italy, played this like snowboard festival thing. And I found out that John was playing the borderline in London. And um, I fucking couldn't believe it. I was like, I begged. I called my I called my manager and I'm like, hey, we're going back to London. John's going to play this show at this club. Can you, can you get me into that show? Is there any, I never asked for anything. She was like, let me see what I can do. And so we come back to London. She goes, oh, dude, you're on the list. Just go down there. Nice. I go, what? So I asked who wants to come with me. Nobody wanted to go. Oh, dude, that, All, that I gone. took Doug, RPJ, I took Jacoby from Papa Roach, the singer. He's like, I'll go with you. So we got in the cab. We went down there and a line around the block kids. I fucking walk up to the front. I go, hey, I think I'm on the guest list. It's John for Shante, right? And she goes, yeah. Yeah, ID. I gave her my passport. She's looking at it. She's looking at me. She's looking through the papers and she goes, oh, yeah. Right here, Chad Benecos. It's you plus 12. And Damn. I go, what the oh. fuck? I turn around. And You're I go, waving them in. <laughs> I, I grabbed the first 10 kids. I'm like, you guys, go ahead. I put them all in there, and then we went and saw the show, and somehow they like they worked it for me, where they're like, hey, whoever was doing his guitars and hanging with him, got a, they got a hold of him. Like, hey, look out for Chad. He's going to be there. He's a huge fan. And so he found me. I don't know how. And he goes, hey, are you, are you that guy, that guitar player from California? And I go, yeah. And he goes, do you want to come watch the show from the side? And I go, fuck yeah. yeah. <laughs> Takes me to the side where all John's acoustics are. And he says, he'll be out. He's going to play. And you can just sit right here. And I go, fucking okay. So I watched the show. It's just him and the acoustic. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> and then uh, he came off. And he goes, hey, don't leave. Uh, he's going to go change. He's probably going to have to sign autographs for a long time, but he's going to hang out with you for a bit. And I go, what? Damn. That's so cool. And he fucking came out. He's like, hey, are you Chad? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, what's up? And we had this weird conversation for like 10 minutes, dude. And um, I, I was like, dude, I don't want to fucking bum you out, but can I just take a picture with you? Like, you're one of my favorites. And then, uh, yeah, I still have that photo. That's awesome. So. I had to bring it up because I, I just saw that show last week at SoFi and it was like super expensive and it was a fucking hassle to get there and all this shit. But it was like just seeing that guy play live for the first time and I don't even know. I think it's been for me personally since 07. Like, God damn, like those riffs are out of fucking control. Yeah. And uh, the solo album that you saw him on, like after that, he put out Californication, by the way, and started Stadium Arcadium, just riffs from a different dimension. You know? Yeah, he was peaking when they did that Slaying Castle thing. Yeah, yeah. I on, holy shit, this guy is on another list. Backups. Yeah. And every solo was on fire. It weirds me out that when he goes in the studio, he doesn't really explode like that. And he saves it for live, where it's like, he'll play he a pretty back. cool solo on the album. And then you know when they start kicking ass live, he's going to just take it, you know. <laughs> He's gonna go off. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's kind of cool though. It's like Eddie Van Halen's style. Like, okay, I now spotlight's on me. I'm just gonna. I mean, his eyes yeah. are in different. He's like looking up into the ceiling. You know, he is one guitar player. Like the guy. Like I love that band. Failure. I love John Frusciante. I love a lot of different people that I just like align with. Like, oh, that's that's me. Awesome, but they're just on a different playing level. I don't know where their whole thing is different. I mean, I don't like them. They're just, they're just technically different. John speaks to me. I'm like, oh, that's how you play guitar, you know, <laughs> super free. He might hit it wrong, though. You don't know. You don't know. You can't tell. You can just tell that it's exciting. It's on the edge of just almost not knowing what he's going to do. Like, that shit drives me nuts, dude. I love it. Mm-hmm. 
Fuck, dude. It's like the all, the, that was a, <laughs> a crazy fucking tangent sidebar conversation on Freshante, but Murderers on that album reminds me of Head P.E. And, and the self-titled record and the riffs that you have on the self-titled record. So I was just thinking, like, the parallel there is basically he's a big influence for you. I don't know if yeah. that was an influence on the self-titled record or not, but there's definitely some, like, out-of-this-universe type riffs on the self-titled record. Yeah, uh, uh, Wes. Wes was a riff master, dude. Um, yeah. No shortage of just good riffs and, and good ideas. And we became a really good guitar team. It took a minute because we're so fucking different, dude. Like, mm -hmm. he's like a Steve Vai. If I'm a John Prashante, right? He, we're, that's that's kind of almost the thing. He's so good. So I was like, oh, fuck that. But he's really cool. He's not like the Shredder dudes that you would think, right? Um, and Jared really had to, like, help me realize that what I was playing when I wasn't trying was the shit that he really liked. Mm. You know, nice. like some of the stuff on, if you have Trip to Realities, I don't know if you have that record. I went in and did, uh, we did the basics. There's a couple songs where I went in there and just played with Ben in the room just to get the shit down. And it would be my scratch guitar track. I was planning on going to redo it all. And we were at home listening to the basics and Jared's like, dude, you're fun. Listen to your guitar right here. And I was like, oh, fuck that. Wait till you hear what I'm going to do. And he's like, what are you talking about? And I go, wait till you hear what I'm going to do when we, when I go redo it. And he's like, dude, you can't redo that. And I was like, what do you fucking mean? That's not fair. I should get to go do my tracks. You know, I have plans. And he's like, dude, like, would you just listen to what you're playing? Like really listen to what you played. Don't think about it like a guitar player. And, and he was right. And I was like, really? I can leave that? He's like, fucking, you can't do it better. And so I was young enough to be like, they helped me, you know, like realize, oh, maybe some of your really free, free shit that you do is the good shit, you know? Well, it's like they, they say playing golf, if you try hard, it's not going to go well. So when you just kind of relax and let the let the right. stuff come to you, you're there. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Not but always. Art but... and music, I think for sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the, that's the power, you know, the total is the, uh, you know, the sum of its parts, right? And in a lot of cases, there's synergies that it's even better than the sum of its parts. So like, that's the power of being in a band. Like, was that right. pretty typical? You guys, you know, kind of yeah. push, pushing each other? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a give and take, right? You, you want to do what you want to do and you want to do what's good for the song and you want to just, you know, everyone's trying to do the best they can, right? Um, and sometimes you don't see it. Like, I remember we had to really work with Mark on bass lines because he'd be like, he was so good that to get him to play something really simple, it would almost be hard. Like, mm -hmm. if you dissect the music on that first record, the riffs are in this other area, and we're doing almost two different things. And then the bass and the drums are like, even over like a heavy riff, it's like, boom, boom, doo -doo, doo -doo, boom. And, and he'd be like, that's fucking boring. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> But once we reached that place where we're like, okay, so do you hear how it's happening right now? Like, that's badass. And he, he he came in to like understand like, oh, and then he just took over when he realized, oh, that's the theory, the hip hop theory. I, I get it. And it happened to all of us, you know, even Jared. I would tell him sometimes like, I really like when you do this with your voice because he had so many voices. He was like, a, um, he had like characters that he would play, right? <laughs> Like sometimes he'd like be like the heavy devil dude, and sometimes he'd be the rapper guy, and sometimes he'd be like the punk, and sometimes whatever. But then every once in a while you hear that real Jared guy come in, right? You're like, oh, that's that's his real thing right now. And he had this way of singing. I remember sometimes he would hit this thing in his throat with compression, and he just could like lay into these notes. And I'm like, dude, I don't think very many people can sing like that. You should do that more. And he'd be like, oh fuck that. <laughs> you couldn't tell him what to do. But I'd be like, no, I'm serious, dude. Like that part is badass and says so sometimes he would go oh yeah i know what you're saying now dude wait till you hear me sing this part you know so it's <laughs> so it it fun it's fun to do that kind of a band where it's not like so black and white there's like so many so many things that you could possibly do we had to almost reel ourselves in like okay let's not get too crazy well yeah and 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 you had a bunch of different styles you were doing too so like it's not even just that there's four or five people in a band. It's there's four or five people in a band, and then they're also playing a bunch of different styles and melding them all together and making it work, yeah. which that record is all of those things. <laughs> well, I'm glad you guys like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, this is a treat. We, we love this shit. 
Ah, dude. That's what cool, are man. your favorite songs in that album? My, for me, uh, Serpent Boy. It's Serpent Boy all day. Wow. Um, I, I think the heaviest song, uh, it's hard to pick, dude. It, I went through phases where I really loved Darky, mm -hmm. and then I really loved Can, and I really loved Serpent Boy. Uh, I think Serpent Boy is probably the hardest hitting song for me. All the parts just really go together really well. The, the, the rip's great and everything. But then there's songs like 33 and hill mm -hmm. and songs where we kind of flex a style that other bands just couldn't touch you know mm -hmm. yep like musically like whoa we're doing a jazz thing or we're doing a hip-hop thing or jared's singing like this can your singer do that i don't think so um <laughs> so for me i was like really into that part of it but those songs didn't really <laughs> do much for us i don't think uh in that genre but they they remind me like oh wow we were fucking on a we were just on a weird level. We were just doing whatever the fuck we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. But Jeff West used to always tell me like, hey, you know why we got to keep doing this is because we could easily streamline our shit and make one whole record of rock riffs and hip hop. You know what I mean? Like bands were doing. But the reason we didn't was like, dude, when we grow up, because we had big dreams for that band. We were like, we're going to we're gonna make records in the future that people won't even know how the fuck we did it, you know? So we were like, if we lay the groundwork where we can do a jazzy thing and we can do a slow thing and a hip hop thing and a punk thing and a, and a hardcore thing, and a, if we can actually do all that stuff and lay the groundwork in the future, we can almost go wherever we want to go and it right. won't be weird. Right. So that was kind of why we did that. And that's why those, some of those weirder songs, they kind of hold a special place for me because uh, they're just outside of the norm heavy thing that we were doing, you know? Yeah, I think for my for my personal favorites, it's Ken Twenty Twelve, IFO, and and like you said, Hill. Hill's awesome. Yeah. Just the, versi it. the versatility of those three songs alone is just like, what is this fucking band? I yeah. mean, the only other vocalists, if we're talking vocals for Jared and, and the, all the voices you're talking about, the only other people that like came to mind listening today were like Dell the Funky Homo Sapien as like a backup or as a vocalist that could maybe somewhat mimic his style and Andre 3000 from Outcast. Other than that, like, right. yeah, Jared is on another level for that record for sure. Yeah, he was, he was, he was doing some shit. I was, I was pretty proud of his vocal performances on that record. I thought they were really good. Only later did I go, man, we kind of went too crazy. I was, I was really critical of it after we did Broke because I thought Broke, then we had outdid ourselves. But, you know, it's nice to hear that people like that first record, you know. You know, you could definitely second guess yourself all the time. I, I mean, I, I, we can relate on a smaller scale, putting out these weekly and having people listen to it and then going back and checking it out maybe a year later and being like, man, I wish I didn't say that or I wish I had cleaned that up a little better. You know what I mean? Like, it's we, we get yeah. that to a smaller level. Yeah, I think too. It's like, um, I mean, there's it's no secret our band had like drug struggles, and um, so we it, not in the beginning, but there was a point where like we were going off so hard, dude. And I mean, like Wes and I would play guitar sometimes, like all day and night. You know what I mean? And we weren't like drug addicts that would like go do weird shit. We were just like, let's fucking play. You know, let's build, let's, let's fucking do this. So, but I can hear it in the album sometimes like, man, we were, we were a little fucked up. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> there's no reason that part needs to be that fast or that part needs to be going on. It's just, it's hard to, sometimes hard for me to listen to it. Like, wow, man, it's chaotic, it's chaos um, at some point, but it all made sense to us, you know? But yeah, it's trippy, dude. When I think back on that stuff, like, wow, fucking A, man. What were we doing? <laughs> well, you're much, you're much younger, and I don't know how long how long had you been playing guitar at that point for this record? Uh, oh God, a long time. I mean, I was good. We were good enough to to know what we wanted to do, and I had had plenty of bands. How long I had been playing guitar? So I started when I was like fifth or sixth grade. So yeah, it's, wow. I don't know, dude. A, a while, a, a long enough while to where I, I felt like I was ready to, to do to do something real. I think Jared was like, I remember him telling some people like, my guitar players are too good. You know, like, I need to like. <laughs> he wanted us to like be looser sometimes. I didn't have that problem. I felt like I was pretty punk. I was like a stoner punk bluesy dude, and Wes was the one that was like so masterful that uh, he could almost do anything he wanted to do. 
So it, it was, it, it was weird. You know, you almost don't want to be too good. Right. You know, it's like, it's weird. And it, it's fucking weird, dude, you guys, because <laughs> I'm not egotistical at all. I don't give a fuck. But there were times where I was getting mad being in the band and going, we're good. We're good. Why is this not happening? Like, why is that band? You know what I mean? And yeah. they'd be like, dirt, 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 dirt. the drummer can't keep time and they're dressed up like dolls or whatever the fuck they're doing. <laughs> I'm not going to call out names, but there'd be times I'd be sitting there listening to them live and, and almost laughing like, what the fuck? Are you serious? I can't even keep time. What the fuck? You know what I mean? But it doesn't matter. You know, it really doesn't. So, yeah, I thought we were all good enough to do it. I thought the only thing that was going to stand in our way was uh, was us, and we did. We we stood in our own way a bunch of times, uh, but we did our shit, you know. But on the flip side, you guys got huge. Maybe not from this album, but certainly from Broke. You guys got fucking massive. Yeah, weird. It's weird to, to say it like that. I didn't you did, feel that Chad, way. You can say it. You can... <laughs> no, I, we don't feel that way. Yeah, yeah we got on K Rock. Yeah, we we're on MTV. E- yeah, you could say we were kind of famous, but we were just that drug fueled band on Ozfest a year before that. We weren't really trying to like put ourselves off as that. So it didn't feel that way. But being in that league, we fucking always felt like the underdogs. Like, didn't matter how many records we sold. You know what I mean? Like, we were like, well, we're not selling as much as Lincoln Park. Or right. corn, or left on all these bands are like, is that awesome? I love all those bands, but I don't think they're better. You know what I mean? Like, it's not about better. It's about that that song is better than yours, or they got played on the radio. Right. Like, you got to accept it. But so you you feel like, oh man, I'm trying so hard. What more do we have to do? You never stop and go. Whoo! Check us out, dude. We're fucking badass. No, it's not that at all. It's always like, oh, let's go. What what else can we do? And let's write some more songs. Let's, you know, let's take it to this level. Let's do that. Let's do this. Make this move. So it wasn't like we, we felt huge. We didn't feel like uh, rock stars. Well, and if you're at all competitive, I mean, that, not, and not with other bands, with yourself even, like, okay, we we did this. We had this EP that blew us up in, th- in two months. We're playing to, to a bunch of strangers. Cool. Then we get signed. Cool. Then this record does really yeah. well, and it gets us to the point where Jive is cool with us putting out Broke, and then Broke takes you to that next level. But you just want to keep going, right? I mean, I get that. Yeah. Yeah, you want to keep going. And and, and not only do you want to keep going, you want to keep growing, mm-hmm. right? At least I do. I get bored real fast, and um, I that was part of why I ended up leaving the band, uh, probably pretty much the whole reason. But I was like, we have to it's not about at that point i was like it's not about these other bands you know they're going to keep making that same record probably over and over again we have the possibility the potential of this band to do anything we want right and i was like really dedicated to uh playing guitar and being an artist and getting to the next level and just growing and growing and growing i wanted to i wanted to like make head pe records that were um just so beyond what we had started out that, that it's like how the Beatles did a pop thing and they ended up making Sergeant Pepper. They're like, fuck, how do you guys do that? Because right. they grew, they were dedicated right to their art. They weren't staying the same forever. And they weren't gonna make 10 records of <laughs> and I was like, I that's it. I had a sitar, I had all this, I was like coming unglued artistically. So I was like, if any band's gonna be thought of as like the Pink Floyd or the Led Zeppelin of this generation and this new metal shit they're calling it has to be us. Yeah. We're the totally. ones that can do it. And it pissed me off that we weren't doing that. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was like, oh my God. Just immediately got embarrassed. I mean, I think you were. I think that's the dichotomy of the music industry is the fact that you put out an art record in an era that was at least, well, 97 was still kind of indie, but like you talk 99 and 2000, it's like, the industry is on fire, so you have to put out stuff that is at least radio friendly or something that's I don't know digestible. So like all the all the bands that you mentioned earlier, they may be heavy. They may you may have come up with them, but at the end of the day, like Lincoln Park's lyricism is pretty digestible. Papa Roach, same great fucking music. We actually ride for all those bands, but 
Fuck yeah. J- Jared talking about UFOs in 97. It's just like, dude, like is, back then it was still kind of taboo. Now UFOs are a different story, but you know what I mean? It's just like, that's just not radio play material at yeah. that time. Yeah. I knew it too. I, I knew it too. And I, I, I was always like, wow, um, we are definitely not doing a commercial thing here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we're coming out talking about racism and cops and UFOs and drugs and chicks. And it's just all weird, right? Government can whatever, yeah. but. You know what's crazy though? All that stuff today is absolutely in the mainstream. It's oh, crazy. exactly. <laughs> we were ahead of our. <laughs> you were, man. Seriously, everything. But yeah, the full record is like, it's kind of playing out. It's, it's similar to Rage Against the Machine. It's kind of all like, oh, wait, this is just a fucking profit album right now. <laughs> well, you know, I get to look back and go, well, that's what we made at that time in that era and it stands on its own two feet and i don't think it's going to go away i think people can always reach back i told somebody else the other day when they're like aren't you pissed like you did so much and then you let it go and it didn't turn out you guys are better than that band and i'm like listen listen I, I i know but some of my favorite bands dude in the band i'm, a, I'm like you guys i fucking love i love shit dude and some of my favorite bands and records, people don't know about them. And oh, yeah. it always drives me crazy. Like, how come such and such is fucking successful and famous and can make a living doing music over and over and over? But in this band, people don't know about them and they're fucking better than everybody. That oh, I fucking drives me crazy. But at the same time, at least they get to be what they are, right? Right. Yep. And people can reach back and go, oh shit, I didn't know about this or that. And then get into it. So even though we didn't get like very, very successful and, and all that, we still did these records and we and we played these shows and we and we made this band. So even now, 20 years later, 25 years later, someone can read back and go, what the fuck is this record? And, <laughs> and be like, how do I know about this? And discover it. And I know that it's good. And I know they can go as deep as they want into it and go, wow. Yeah. Trippy, dude. It's a trippy thing. Yeah. No, and it, it's like we said, we're talking about it now 25 years later because it resonated with us and it will resonate with more people. It, it continues to do that, I think. Yeah, I hope so, dude. You know, I hope that over time, like when people go, wow, at, at that time it was this, this and this and this band came out. Yeah, that's good enough for me, you know, definitely like makes me happy when I when I meet people that are like, no, 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 no. I know about that record. And I'm like, really? You fucking do? Uh, I'm still nice. surprised, you know? And that's why I honestly, I think conversations like this are so great because unless you know what was going on, which you just chronicled of the last hour, you might not appreciate, you know, the album in all its glory. You know what I mean? Having this backdrop of, well, no one else is doing that. And this was a fusion of all that. And this is the product of that. It's like, damn. Yeah. You know, um, it was really like, I was just so happy with Linkin Park, not because they got so successful and their songs are so great it was mostly because people would cite them why people would talk shit like oh fuck my biscuit there yeah i hate them and they're just trying to do your thing but not even close that i wouldn't even I'd be like whatever dude mm-hmm. but with lincoln park they blew everyone out of the water right maybe not like artistically and and, and crazy but commercially and in every other way they just murdered it and um the reason i loved it so fucking much more is because they had no problem going, listen, dude, we used to go watch you guys. You know, uh, Chester would be like, dude, I've seen your band play 20 times, dude. My old band opened up for you a bunch of times. And, and uh, I was like, this is so cool. Because you guys could just be like, fuck head PE. Mm-hmm. We don't want them opening up for us. They're too good. Right. Or, or, or just bury it. They were like championing us. Yep. You know, I have videos where we'd be on, we were opening up for them. I mean, they were opening up for us. We ended up opening up for them later because they wanted to like pay us back almost. And um, Chester would go on these long rants, dude, to the crowd, like, you know, I have a fucking band that you just saw, and, you know, and their fucking label didn't give them the money to come out here because we had already spent all our touring money. They came out here on their own to play for you, and that fucking band, and he would just go off. And I was thinking, yeah, who does that? You know what I mean? Wow. Yeah, that's I crazy. Would. But yeah, it's so fucking cool. And so I was always like, nah, uh, I don't care if anyone knows that we influenced these bands i know it yeah. and it's and they know it and they weren't afraid to say it so you know I, I don't care what i have to do with my life i get to 
I get to have that. That's something yeah. I, I'll always be super proud of, you know? Yeah. And I don't say it because most people be like, yeah, right, dude. What the fuck are you talking about? You know, <laughs> you guys know music. So yeah, we can talk about that. But in my mind, I think that like, thank God for bands like that, you know, that pay homage to the, you know, the underground bands that they listen to or whatever. Uh, that's just a sign of like maturity, mm -hmm. you know? Absolutely. It's maturity. And they're really confident in their own shit. They're not threatened by anything. They're like, oh, fuck yeah, fucking head PE. You know, they don't have any problems. I, I really respected that from them, you know? Yep. I think Chester is almost like almost beyond vocal on who matters because we had uh, Jonah Montranga from Far on here. And uh, I had read an article in like a European magazine called Kerrang! And he had called out Far and Jonah Montranga in particular for one line drawing. He said, yeah, is it, you know, that guy is from Sacramento, big, big influence on me. And this is Lincoln Park in like Meteora era. No one knows about Far. No one knows about one line drawing, you know? Yeah, we know about Far. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and Chester, like, let's be honest, like, I think many people could sing like that. And uh, I mean, he would hit notes. I remember there'd be like times where he'd be like, just joking around like this, like, can you hit, can you hit that note? And he'd be like, ah! Can you hit this note? Ah! He would just be able to hit any note. Know, but not like just hit it, like hit it fucking rad. And you're like, oh my God, dude. You could do that to any note. You just sound like that. <laughs> Fuck, that's awesome. You know, they hit the jackpot when they got that guy. <laughs> All right, Chad, thank you for, for taking this trip down memory lane, talking about self-titled. Uh, we could do broke down the road if you want. Uh, we, can, we can do uh, what you're doing, you know, what you've done since then, all that stuff uh, down the road. But we really appreciate talking with you about uh, self-titled tonight. Awesome, dude. I appreciate you guys, too. I'll help you out any way I can. Right on. Yeah, I appreciate this. This was fun. This is a lot of fun. And I'm going to listen to that album, like, more than I usually do now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, 25 years of self-titled, amazing masterpiece record. There's only one thing that bugs the shit out of me is the fact that I can't get this on wax. I can't get this on vinyl. It pisses me <laughs> off. Let's we'll see what we can do about that. I've been yeah, talking about that. No, Patio Slave slash Head PE go find me. Let's do this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Chad. Appreciate it. Yeah. All right, that wraps our conversation with Chad Benekos, uh, founding member of Head PE and uh, original rhythm guitarist. And man, we I'm excited to see his excitement when talking about the self-titled record because we are all right for that. I would say we all think that's better than Broke. You know, as good as Broke is, as, as much as we love that record, I would, I'm would i probably grabbing self-titled first every time. Oh, 100%. I mean... Self-titled is the artistic fucking sketchbook pencil drawing of a UFO next to fucking Mayan Mexican calendar type 2012 shit, you know, like, and then put together and signed to a major label and they were still like, yeah, let's fucking run with the shit that we've been doing, you know, and maybe write six or seven more songs, but like at least keep the vibe of that record. And Chad, I think, dove into that. He's like, hey, it's collectively as a band they were like, hey, it's now or never, like, let's do what we've been doing let's if it ain't broke let's you know why fix it type thing which blew my mind during that interview because it's jive records for us is britney spears in sync or backstreet boys whatever you want to call it and head pe self-titled is like fucking indie record galore and definitely not major label-esque but he obviously dove into that during the interview but at the time they signed in 96 or 97 that wasn't the label identity at the time. So it kind of makes sense. It actually makes more sense now more than ever. And that's why we do these interviews. Yeah. I mean, you nailed it. There's two things that I loved, which again, just piggybacking on what you said about that conversation. One is they didn't fold their sound at all. Like that, what you got was may maybe a better mixed or mastered uh, version of what they were great before that with uh, church realities. And then two jive didn't really, pressure them it didn't sound like to put a single out like that's weird right that's it's, it's interesting but i love it like they had they had everything to lose right the label jived it and in the fact that you know you got what i would have expected from a label with the next record right with broke you know get the single out there so this is a real treasure and when you say scrap uh you know sketchbook scrap notes look at the look at the album cover and I think product oh, did yeah. that, right? I mean, it's just scribblings. Yep. It's amazing. It, it, it's a time capsule album. It's great. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And it is one of those kind of pull from all these different places and put together and make this thing that doesn't, 
if you're going to tell me it's going to be funk and punk and uh, hip hop and hardcore and it's all going to come together and you're going to put it in the oven, it's going to turn into this amazing piece of art. I'm, I'm, I would have been skeptical, skeptical, especially in that time frame, especially in 1996, 1997, when they were putting this together. I would have been like, nah, dude, this is, you, you got to pick one thing or pick two things, not seven, but they pick seven and they put them all together and it's fucking awesome. Oh my God, you nailed it because it's like at that time, you got to think 96, 97, we're like seventh grade, like that's, well, we're talking very subjective right now, but like at that time, like you were into metal or you're into hip hop, you're into punk or you're into fucking thrash. Like you can't be multi, you know, multi-genre. So like as a record label where like that is your bread and butter as a business plan, as your record label that was defined that was that was the model so like case in point like i can't imagine i really honestly don't know and he de he definitely gave context on how that came down but like the record labels you would think they would have bigger fucking borders on the side of like no you got to do this um but they still did it and to his point they had other labels chomping at the bit and they went with jive over epic which were other labels where you know their peers went platinum so it's it's kind of a unique story in that regard. It was. I mean, someone at Jive saw something in the band, and that's you got to give them credit for, you know, beyond what they're used to. So he said, who else was on Jive at that time? Do we know? Uh, Tribe. He's talking about Tribe, Tribe. Quest, which so I mean, I think the... we all ride for them too. Yeah. Right. I wonder who else though. Like, it's just yeah. I'd a, have to look. It's a strange signing, but I it's it makes me appreciate that entity even more. And, you know, we always talk about this. A lot of the conversations we have on this, on this podcast do elevate the music. They do elevate the albums. This is one of those that, that does. And it, it, it paints a picture of a band that stayed true to the roots. And uh, I, think it, I think it hit tremendously. I, I think this album sold a couple hundred thousand records. Like in Chad's eyes, you know, he always wanted more. But, uh, I mean, that's amazing for a band that didn't, didn't shift from the jump at that right. point. Yeah, they they were them, which is why we loved them and why we still ride for that record now today, twenty five plus years on. Now uh, it's it's a it's a classic for us. It's a I mean, if whatever box you want to throw it in, but don't because it's it's in a bunch of different boxes. It doesn't fit in one. But yeah, great great record, great conversation with Chad. Really really happy you guys tuned in and and got to uh, check this piece of artwork out from us and uh, this is what we do every week and we'll be back next week with more stuff and can't wait to do it again with you boys as we always do and one thing we didn't actually even talk about in the conversation with chad is back in 2020 so what two years ago he put together a film it was called touring for broke a head pe film it's it's a film that he actually filmed back in the broke era right so we're talking 22 years ago he edited it and he put it all put it all out. It's on YouTube now. I might be in other mediums, but it's awesome. And we always talk about, you know, snapshot in time. It is a true snapshot in time. It's backstage stuff. It's uh tattoo the earth footage, you know, it's all it's gold. There's cameos of all your favorite bands. Go check it out. Do yourself a favor, go check it out. Yep, two and a half years in the making for the self titled head PE record. Check that record out. I'd recommend it in headphones in particular just to get the kind of, I don't know, in between the lines messaging in that record. But yeah, great fucking interview. Chad is the man and uh, 25 years of self-titled. So we'll see you next time. Cheers. See ya. Peace, potheads. Thank you for listening to Patio Slave. We are at Patio Slave on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, all of the places that you can find us on social media. Facebook, Patio Slave Podcast. YouTube, Patio Slave Podcast there. Email us at patioslavepodcast at gmail.com. And hey, if you want to become a supporter, click on the link at the bottom of the episode and give us a dollar, give us five bucks. It keeps the lights on, keeps us going. We really appreciate that stuff. Thank you.